Good morning and uh, welcome to this uh, panel at the Paris uh, Forum. Uh, I'm sure many of you have been here for a long time, so you know how this works. We're looking forward to a very uh, engaging discussion on a topic of great importance, which is uh, topics of human rights, human rights and human rights defenders. For those of you who are not familiar, on the screens the, you'll see what channel you need to be on if you need to listen to this in French or in English. Uh, but let me start with a few words on what the topic we're going to be exploring today and then introduce you to our, our panelists. This year marks 70 years since the, declaration, the Universal Declaration on Human Rights, 20 years since the Declaration on the Human Rights Defenders. And it's been a long period and we can obviously focus on everything that has not gone right. And we'll be talking today about the fact that in many countries, human rights are not being respected and that we're facing serious headwinds uh, today, whether it's the rise of illiberalism, whether it's the fact that so many countries now are focusing in transactional politics, uh, focusing on issues that are very close to home but don't really have an impact or have a negative impact on human rights abroad, whether it's uh, trying to curb migration or to, or to fight terrorism uh, or what is often called terrorism at all costs. Um, you have some countries that are focused so much that they, they, and they're beginning to relativize the question of, of human rights. Even, even countries like the one that we are in right now, which has been in, under this president, uh, a defender of human rights when it has come to recent, uh, the recent tragic uh, murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, said, well, we have to be careful not to allow an issue like that to complicate our relations with uh, a sovereign state with which we have important relations. So we're seeing these headwinds, we're seeing the rise of populism, we're seeing the rise of nativism, we're seeing an erosion of norms, an erosion of norms that we could see in countries like Syria or Myanmar, or, uh, or even in countries closer to home, uh, where, again, the erosion of norms, the erosion of the respect for human rights, threats to human rights defenders uh, are present for all to see. But I don't only want this to be a session on everything that's going wrong or everything that still needs to be achieved, but also to take a look back at what progress has been made over the last 70 and 20 years and try to understand why that progress has been made, what are the ingredients that have allowed those progress, that progress to be made and how to protect it, and then to look at the challenges that are still there and how to overcome them, and in the spirit of the forum, not to stare at the problem, but to think of practical solutions. And to do that, we have three very um, fantastic panel we have uh, today to, to discuss this, people who've been in the trenches, who've been in the forefront, who sometimes have suffered for, for, for the, the actions that they've, they've taken. Um, and so I want to introduce them and then we will turn to the presentation of a specific project and again in the spirit of the forum, uh, a, a project about how to defend uh, human rights defenders. So let me start with uh, uh, Ankara Nelapajit, who's uh, Thailand um, National Commission for Human Rights, and who, of course, will talk to us about the situation in her own country, but more broadly, and her, your experience in terms of your struggle to defend human rights and the defenders of human rights. Um, Bruno Stagno, who is with us from uh, Executive Director of Human Rights Watch, obviously one of the organizations at the forefront that has done the most to protect, defend, and... Uh, Not least, uh, Andrew Anderson, who's the executive defender of uh, executive director of Frontline Defenders, and who'll be talking to us about the specific project that uh, that you've presented here to the forum. So maybe we could start with that, Andrew, and you could uh, have a few minutes to tell us about your project and about uh, how it's already achieved some of the goals that you've set for it. Good morning. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for the kind words of introduction and. Uh, it's our honor as frontline defenders to be one of the board members of protectdefenders.eu and we're, we have a rotating chair of the board which we currently hold so it's our pleasure to have the opportunity to talk a little bit about that project here this morning. The protectdefenders.eu is an EU funded human rights defenders mechanism that was set up three years ago to provide practical support to human rights defenders at risk around the world. It's a consortium composed of 12 international and regional human rights organizations who have networks around the world working uh, on the issue of human rights defenders in many different forms, uh, organizations working on women human rights defenders, on LGBTI rights defenders, on defenders working on land rights and environmental rights, as well as those working more generally on the subject of the protection of human rights defenders. And because we have that 
strong network around the world, we've been able to deliver practical support to those most at risk. We've delivered grants to 1,100 human rights defenders for emergency support. Some of those grants are provided within 48 hours to those people who are most at risk. For example, we've just delivered uh, grants to eight LGBTI rights defenders in Tanzania who are needing to find safe uh, places to, to hide in the midst of the current crackdown uh, that's being promoted by uh, the government and one of the regional governors in Tanzania at the moment. Um, we've provided uh, funding for temporary relocation for 380 human rights defenders over the last three years. And it's important to say that two-thirds of the over 11,000 beneficiaries belong to particularly targeted groups, including those defending the rights of women, LGBTI, land, environment, and also particularly rural human rights defenders. One of the things we've been trying to do is make sure that we are able to provide support to human rights defenders who are not working in the capital cities, who are not already well connected uh, to international human rights organizations, who are often those who are most targeted and most vulnerable. And over the course of the last three years, we've provided 8.1 million euros in support. And that's a big number and a, and a big statistic, but it's really about providing as, as immediate and practical support as possible to people when they most need help. And by doing that, hopefully enabling human rights defenders under attack to be more resilient, to be able to sustain their work, to be able to continue uh, to work to achieve justice and to defend the rights of the communities they work on behalf of. Thank you. And that's a good segue. And then I want to come back and see whether there are any comments on, on that project. But it's, it's, you know, even listening to you talking about LGBTI rights, uh, women's rights, uh, environmental activist rights, that is already a snapshot of the progress that's been made, some of the issues that were not at the forefront 70 years ago, even 20 years ago, which have now become part of the international norms of, of what needs to be protected, what needs to be defended. So I want to use that. Um, and, and, and in some ways, the crackdown that we're experiencing today or the, the attempts to silence these voices is a tribute to the fact that those voices are now more heard. And we were discussing it privately earlier that you, know, you have more defenders of human rights than you've ever had before. You have more activism than you've had before. You have people using social media more than they have before. All of that has triggered some of the responses, which is trying to crack down on those voices and trying to use social media to undo the progress that that's made. Uh, so Bruno, if I could turn, uh, turn to you, since obviously you have a global perspective on the, on the status of human rights around the world. If we want to start on a semi-positive note, because there'll be enough depressing notes as we continue the conversation, how do you look at it if in the grand sweep of things over the last several decades, what progress do you see has been made and what have been the main tools that have allowed that? So I think there's no doubt that if you consider the arc of history over the past 70 years, today we have the largest portion of the world's population that is fairer, freer, that is living healthier, better, longer, lives than ever before. So, and that is, I think, a direct result in part, not only of a, a number of instruments that have been adopted in the international community, but more concretely, of the 27 rights that are enshrined in the Universal Declaration for Human Rights. I think that's undeniable. Um, we have had a tremendous also positive arc of history in terms of accountability, with the establishment in the 90s of what were known as the ad hoc international tribunals for Rwanda, and also for the former Yugoslavia, which were really threshold moments, game changers of sorts, of course dedicated to very specific uh, mass atrocity crime situations. The establishment in 1998 and 2002, the actual coming into being of the International Criminal Court, which some people obviously might have issues with, and yes, well, part of the promise of the ICC still has to deliver, but it still is a remarkable achievement by the international community. There's still issues, of course, pertaining to its universality, but it's still, I think, very positive work coming forward. The fact that even in situations as dire as Syria or as Myanmar, which have attracted a lot of media attention, um, there are basically two unsung heroes here in terms of accountability. Um, it hasn't attracted media attention, but we have today um, me international mechanisms that are preparing case-ready files to be presented to a future international court or to a national court or some type of hybrid court in terms of the violations being committed in Syria and also in Myanmar by all parties. So I think that there is a lot to be hopeful for. There is a lot to be proud of. 
But we are, of course, at a very difficult moment, a geopolitical moment that actually transcends human rights. It's a very dire geopolitical moment. And what we need is a reinforcement of moral courage and of a political audacity and creativity by those that want to defend the values and principles of the world that we have constructed as an international community that believes that the safety of one is the safety of all. So thank you. And I want to come back to the, the, the question of how to, you know, how to instill that moral courage and how that moral courage could actually translate into change on the ground. But just to, 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 to press you a little bit, the progress that's been made, if you had to think of what were the, I mean, is it the arc of history that just bends towards progress, as President Obama used to say, or is it, is it something about the form of activism or, or, or mechanisms in specific states? And I'll turn to you, Kana, uh, in a second. Um, what do you view as having uh, been the most effective tools for protecting and then enshrining these rights? Yeah, so I don't, I don't want to believe that just, you know, history has been kind to us. No. At every one of these critical moments, it has been because we have had leaders and states that have had the, the audacity to lift beyond what is the minimum common denominator, to have civil society that has been moving behind. So things like, you know, the interdiction of landmines, the International Criminal Court, uh, the Human Rights Defenders Convention, all of this is because you have engaged public citizens supporting those states that want to be courageous and lead. Um, so it is the conjunction between states that want to move forward, that want to show that audacity, but also a civil society that is engaged and that wants to understand that we need to build better and larger global public goods. And that's the only way in order to find the peace and stability and also the rights for human, uh, for, for all human uh, beings that, that we all crave for. Thank you. So, Ankana, turning, turning to you and, and, and with the same question and your own experience, which is slightly different, and maybe you want to say a little bit about it, what, what you've been doing in Thailand. Um, how do you look at the progress over the, the recent period or the longer period, whether it's in your country or, or in, uh, in uh, Southeast Asia more, more broadly? And again, what do you think have been the main tools that have achieved the progress that we have achieved? And of course, we'll have to turn to the progress that we haven't achieved. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as uh, women human rights defenders, I think that uh, now uh, uh, human rights defenders faces a lot of problems. I think uh, in the past yet, a uh, lot of uh, human rights defenders were killed it or disappeared it, and they have no uh, further investigation. Especially in country. Um, I think uh, it's very challenging uh, for the role of human rights defenders. And for myself, as a commissioner, National Human Rights Commission, Thailand, I think that the human rights institutions have very critical roles to play to protect the human rights defenders. For my experiences, um, I think that uh, in many countries, maybe the state officer mostly think that Human rights defenders, uh, like the, the person who received the money from abroad and tried to attack uh, our countries. But if we look at the human rights defenders on the ground, we will see that uh, most of the affected community now, they change themselves to be the defenders. And they try to protect their land rights, national resources, because now we have really uh, a lot of big projects and it's affected to the, to the people and to the community as well. Um, one thing I think is important is um, now uh, we have a lot of, after we have a uh, human rights declaration and all countries ratify the international convention, ICCPI, ESCR, CEDAW, uh, uh, even in uh, convention against torture. And we received a lot of recommendations uh, from the UN and also the UPR mechanism <clears throat> give a lot of recommendations to all countries. <clears throat> and, and I think that uh, many countries accepted the recommendations of the UPR to protect human rights defenders. For example, in my country, Thailand, they have around 10 recommendations on human rights defenders. So that uh, how can the state follow uh, what the UPR recommendations and have the concrete 
solution to protect human rights defenders. I think, as I said, as I mentioned earlier, that human rights defenders in the past they faced a lot of uh, intimidation or harassment, but now the situation changed. Um, a lot of human rights defenders face this judicial harassment. So uh, many of the human rights defenders, they might be prosecuted more than 10 cases. Uh, in every day, they have to spend their life by going to the court every day. And for women human rights defenders, uh, it's affected a lot to their daily life. For women, they have their children, they have to look to take care of their family. By the way, they have to earn more money to go to the court. Even though, uh, in, in, uh, for example, in Thailand, uh, we have the justice bill. We have the justice fund to allow uh, people to access for bail. But when, when the human rights defenders were prosecuted, five, six, or seven, or more than 10, uh, the justice fund have not enough money to support the people. So I think this is some kind of new harassment. And also, another thing I want to highlight is about online attack to human rights defenders. Now there's a lot of online attack to human rights defenders and a lot of hate speech. So I think that it's the responsibility of the state to protect uh, the human rights defenders, uh, not to allow the online attack or maybe uh, in all countries, I think that we need to have the, 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 the law to protect human rights defenders, not uh, allow everybody to like the uh, prosecuted every the human rights defenders with easily. And other thing I want to highlight is I think that uh, democracy is very important because uh, if we have no democracy, people and people have uh, no right to speak out. And when they cannot speak out or they cannot. Uh, 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 anti some project that affected to the uh, communities. Many of them were arrested because uh, they can, they have very limited freedom of expression. They cannot speak what they want. They can organize some uh, peaceful protest. I am, I'm threat the, that uh, is the peaceful protest that people not allowed to, to act. Yes. Thank you. I don't, Andrew, if you want to jump in on, on any of this and obviously the issue of defending human rights activists, but if you want to say one more word on the positive side, because then I have a lot on the less, less positive side. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think it's important to recognize that there are more human rights defenders doing more good work in more places than ever before. When you look 20 years ago, uh, we had a big conference of human rights defenders here in Paris, the first World Summit of Human Rights Defenders, and there were many countries where it was impossible it was not safe to bring human rights defenders from, and or it was more, very difficult to work for human rights in those countries. We just had, a week ago, a second World Summit of Human Rights Defenders, and we had 153 defenders from 105 countries. There could have been many more countries, because there are human rights defenders working on a, a wide array of issues in nearly every country uh, on the planet. And those people are making a difference. That's why there is this concerted backlash against human rights activism. People, governments and populist leaders and other powerful institutions know that it's local people working to defend and advance their human rights who make a difference, whether it's on land rights or women's rights or LGBTI rights. And those things are advancing. If we look globally at the issue of women's rights or LGBTI rights, we see a very well-coordinated and funded backlash on those issues. We see homophobic hate campaigns, etc., uh, being used by populist leaders in a number of places, often for reasons to divert attention from their own corruption or authoritarianism. But part of the reason they're doing that is because there is an advance. There are more people supporting equality, tolerance, pluralism. There are more, there's big advances in terms of women's rights. Still a long, long way to go in many countries. And often those advances achieved at a high price with killings of human rights defenders, very bad attacks on human rights defenders. But human rights is a contest. It's not something that comes down from the powerful uh, as some kind of benevolence. 
Human rights has always been about power and accountability, about equality and discrimination. It's about mobilizing people at the local level to achieve progress, to achieve change, to press leaders to implement laws that protect human rights, to make advances in terms of equality and inclusion. And we're winning that battle. We're, we're facing some defeats. We're facing a big backlash. The bad guys are more organized and are putting more resources into the pushback against human rights than ever before. Our, the governments who are supposed to be the good guys, uh, the, the democratic governments are weaker on human rights than they were. But overall, the, the human rights movement at the local level, at the grassroots level, has never been stronger or more robust. And that's why we're making progress. Thanks. I think that is one message to take away from this session already, which is that the, for all of the, the, the setbacks, uh, the situation is probably stronger, or more, more established, or, or the defense and the norms of human rights are more established than they've been. But I do want to uh, now look at the challenges and, and think of concrete ways of overcoming them. So if I look at everything that you've said so far, whether it's sort of international conventions or institutions, it's hard to imagine today, given where we are, that we're going to get more progress in, 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 in an international consensus on forms of accountability or forms of or norms of human rights, just because of the, the state of the world today, which you referred to, uh, which goes beyond human rights. At the state level, I think you are seeing if, if some years ago the norm was democracy and human rights that was sort of the lingua franca that's the, the currency that people used whether they applied it or not but that's what they felt was their entry ticket countries felt was their entry ticket to a legitimate place in the in the arena of nations today it's very different and you see it country after country reverting to forms of populism nationalism nativism anti-liberalism anti-globalism which is often uh, uh, defined in, 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 in different ways uh, but all of which is it produces a much more hostile environment to the struggles that you are, you are engaged in. And again, one could list the countries who don't really, who do face impunity. And whether it's Syria, Russia, uh, Myanmar, uh, t uh, Turkey, um, Venezuela. I mean, we can go down the list. You know, even countries that are closer to our own, uh, you know, to, to, to Western world, whether it's Poland, uh, Hungary, or whether it's Israel, et cetera, et cetera. And whether it's the United States and the a president who says that the media is the enemy of the people. All of these are different gradations. They're not all the same, but they do create a, uh, a, an atmosphere. Um, so if there is less appetite for international sort of consensus on, on how to move these uh, norms forward, if the, at the level of states there's also a greater pushback, and if holding countries accountable, uh, people, you know, the, what is the instrument? Sanctioning countries and people view their commercial and transactional interests involved. It does leave so much of the onus on individual activists, civil society, non-government organizations. So in that, in that environment, turn to you uh, again, Bruno. What, how do you counter this, uh, these challenges and what do you think needs to happen so that you could, you could flip the narrative? Well, th there is no one single solution, of course. It has to be done on a case-by-case -case basis. But I think that in many of the situations that you mentioned, be it Venezuela, uh, sure, it's a dire situation, but after all, there has been, for example, a joint referral by a number of countries within the region of the situation in Venezuela to the International Criminal Court. That is a very important marker. You mentioned Syria. Liechtenstein led a remarkable and very courageous initiative in the General Assembly of the United Nations to establish something that is today op fully operational, which is known as the International Independent Impartial Mechanism, which is looking into war crimes committed by all parties in Syria. Myanmar, there has been now a replication of that very same mechanism I just mentioned by, uh, regarding Syria for Myanmar against, obviously, the will of Myanmar and China, as you can imagine. How was it done through the Human Rights Council to skirt the Security Council, where you presumably would have gotten a veto? If you look into, so I can go down the list, and presumably in all of them, we can find an accountability mechanism that we have been able to somehow fashion to respond to that case-specific situation. Um, and what you need you mentioned sanctions. Sanctions, I think, are a very significant tool. They must not be cast aside. I'm not talking about generalized sanctions that would apply to and have unintended impacts on civilians. We're talking about very targeted sanctions against those who make decisions regarding 
the targeting of civilians or for very serious human rights violations against civilians. So these are basically the generals in Myanmar. These are basically those who lead the Saudi-led coalition in Yemen. Those are, for example, those that lead the war in Syria. So targeted sanctions, that means freezing their bank accounts, putting travel bans on them. I think they can be quite significant tools, not used alone, but in conjunction with other tools that are available. And finally, I would say uh, you need the moral courage. You mentioned the democracies that no longer are finding this moral courage. They need to find it. And what's interesting is that as London and Washington and Paris have been losing, and the Scandinavians have been losing some of the moral outrage they had in the past, what you're seeing is actually small and medium-sized countries that don't have as significant commercial and political implications in some of these conflicts who are basically leading the charge. As I mentioned, it was Liechtenstein on Syria. It's the Netherlands on Yemen. Um, so the, this is the way forward. It's Iceland on the Philippines. These are very interesting examples of countries that are finding the moral outrage and courage to lead the international community to put the onus of accountability on those who are committing the most serious violations. So a question for any of you, and just to play devil's advocate, I think there, people would say there's sort of a crisis in both of those tools that you mentioned, the tool of, uh, of, of, of accountability. Um, first of all, there's, as you mentioned, the, 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 the crisis of legitimacy of the ICC and the, the notion that it is not unbiased, whether that's true or not, and that it's often victor's justice. Um, the fact that it doesn't really produce results. You could hold countries, you could create this institution hasn't changed their behavior. That's even more so on the case of sanctions, which has become the tool of first, second, and third resort when people don't want to do something else, they resort to sanctions, at least some countries do. And I'm curious, are there cases that you could point to where sanctions have worked to improve a human rights situation? And if so, what, what, what made them work? Again, any of you, if you want to speak about either instruments of accountability or sanctions, a concrete cases where those have worked and what circumstances lend themselves to positive results? Please. Well, just on, on the issue of sanctions, we saw in Sudan in the last year that uh, when uh, President Obama in one of his last acts lifted sanctions on Sudan and that lifting was temporary for six months and much to our surprise uh, in June last year uh, the US decided not to automatically wave through the lifting of those sanctions and that led to human rights defenders being released inside Sudan including Dr. Mudawi Ibrahim Adam, one of the human rights defenders whose cases we were taking up uh, and pressing on. He was one of those who was being released. His organization, the Sudan uh, Social De Development Organization, is in the process of being allowed to operate again inside Sudan. That's because of the pressure related uh, to the sanctions and the fact that the US was not waving through the, the lifting of them. There's also been at least a little bit of action on uh, reducing the level of violence uh, in Darfur. So, you know, there's plenty of examples where sanctions have not been so brilliantly implemented and or they've been implemented for a short period of time and uh, then lifted when there's been no real progress. We saw that with the EU and uh, Uzbekistan a number of years ago where the Uzbeks increased the number of human rights defenders in prison at the moment that the EU lifted uh, the sanctions. So there's lots of poor examples too, but there's no doubt in my mind, that they can be an effective measure when they're used in a targeted way and when governments have the backbone to stick to the principles that led them to impose the sanctions in the first place. Anyone else want to come in on this? I totally agree with what Andrew has said. Obviously, we can have a long debate about sanctions and the utility of sanctions, but what's indispensable is to have them properly implemented. Um, they sh should lead to a change in behavior. And one of the problems that we see traditionally is that the sanctions are not necessarily coordinated between the unilateral sanctions imposed by states, the multilateral sanctions imposed, say, by the EU or the United Nations, and, for example, those that have been identified as the main perpetrators. Just very quickly, for example, on Darfur, on the genocide in Darfur. It's very interesting to see that the seven individuals that have been primarily targeted by the International Criminal Court as those who are primarily responsible for the, the situation in Darfur, none of them have been targeted by the United Nations Security Council. Those that are targeted are actually four other, other individuals who presumably are not the most responsible. So of course the sanctions are not going to work if you're not targeting the right people. So that's where you need the moral courage to also put the sanctions that will hurt those who are making the decisions. 
So if I could ask you, Ankana, since you actually, you know, you were in your own country, you were fighting for, for, for human rights, what role did outside players play that you found most useful in your own, uh, in your own struggles? Um, I think that the international communities uh, can have like sanction uh, and not only sanction, but they should have the good recommendation to the countries as well. I think uh, political will is very important. I think in each country, they, 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 need, they have to have the political will to protect their own population, their own citizen. And it, it is the responsibility of state to protect all of their people all of the person who who living in that state. I think the international communities can keep recommendation and can support uh, whatever. But I think the problem must be solved in the in in, in each country. For my uh, experiences, I think that um, if they have no political will, maybe some of the human rights defenders was killed or disappeared it. And if the state have no political will to investigate, to have seriously investigation, even though you have the recommendation or even though you have uh, sanctioned by other uh, international communities, they have nothing changed. But uh, I think that, uh, by the way, uh, international community can sanction for, for something, and they should have the recommendation and I think that uh, as the member of the United Nations, I think all countries must uh, respect it to uh, what uh, to the to the obligation what they have promised. Um, one thing I think is is, uh, is a problem is that for the implementation. I think we when we ratify a lot of conventions and how can we have the organic law? that comply with the international law. So I think this is uh, very important. And how can the, the people can, can use the international law when they were prosecuted uh, to protect their own rights? Um, I think this is uh, this very important. And you know that uh, for the recommendation from, for the, from the uh, UN committee or uh, the UPR, it cannot enforce that, but I think it's the state obligation to do what they promise. And I think uh, what's important as, as myself, as a women human rights defenders, I think the most important is uh, in all nation have to, I think all nation have to respect the role of human rights defenders. I think this is very important. They must not think that human rights defenders is the enemy. Not think that uh, human rights defenders is only the person who want to attack the government. I think uh, if we if we uh, talk with the human rights defenders, we will see that uh, we have a lot of uh, human rights defenders, and and we increase. Some some state may think that if someone disappear, the problem will will appear, but it's not true. Maybe some, when somebody will uh, kill that or disappear, they will have more and more people stand up to protect human rights. So I think that uh, this is, uh, for, for myself now as a human rights, as a human rights commission, I think uh, the critical role of human rights institution in all the country is uh, the mandate to protect uh, the human rights defenders, and to investigate all the cases, and to give the smart recommendation to the to the state, to the cabinet, how the uh, state can protect human rights defenders. I think we have the now we celebrate the 20 years of uh, human rights defenders declaration, but how can it implemented in the organic law in each country? I think this is a very important issue. But so from your experience dealing with authorities in your country or other countries, I mean, that argument, obviously, it's a moral argument. It's not clear why it would have that much resonance with 
know, leaders in a country for whom they do, they do see human rights activists as a threat. I, you know, you could invoke moral or, or even uh, practical considerations, but what have you found to be the most effective way of getting them to change their behavior? Is it, I mean, the, the tools that we've heard, it's civil society act activism, it's uh, international condemnation, sanctions, accountability, or it's trying to persuade uh, government officials in the country itself. How, how could that be done when clearly they're pursuing these policies because they think it's in their interest? Uh, for my experiences uh, now, I think that um, uh, the people, they have their network and they work together. And I think that if they have their strong network working together so that uh, they can keep the recommendation to the government as well and they can try to protect uh, themselves. Um, by the way, uh, I think that for, for Thailand, for my country, uh, we got a lot of recommendations from the UN or from the international communities, the uh, EU as well. But uh, we failed, I think we failed to protect the human rights defenders. We have no uh, organic law, we have no regulation to protect uh, human rights defenders. So I think uh, what, I, uh, what, uh, what I'm doing is uh, working with, uh, with the people, with the human rights defenders. And I think that uh, now they are really courage and I, I have a good opportunity to meet a lot of women human rights defenders as well. I think um, now we have the, um, uh, a lot of problem about business and human rights. When we, when we talk about business, we have a lot of big industrial. We have a lot of investment. By the way, a lot of people lost their land and a lot of people are affected by some factory. Some people have lead poisoning in their blood. They have uh, some seriously disease. So I think this is uh, very important. We can, sometimes we can use the, like the global compact on human rights defenders to, uh, sorry, the global compact on business and human rights. And we, we should use this uh, to protect the human rights defenders as well. And I want to focus uh, about the gender lens. I think, uh, Gender is very important uh, because uh, we should uh, include gender in, in the cross-cutting, in, in everything. And uh, I think that uh, for myself, uh, uh, my experience, I, I investigate a lot of cases of human rights defenders. And I think uh, it's very uh, suffering when uh, human rights defenders face the intimidation. Some women human rights defenders face sexual harassment and uh, nobody care. And they can, uh, I think that uh, they have no law to, to protect, they have no law to, to guarantee that people can exercise their freedom of expression, how people can uh, talk directly to, to their own government, what happened to them, what they are concerned, what effect uh, to the communities. I think uh, we have to, uh, to concentrate and to, to, like, uh, to open our mind and we have to change uh, our mindset also. I think maybe in, in many countries they have really bad attitude toward human rights defenders. As I mentioned earlier, this mostly think that human rights defenders want to attack the government or want to untie the development. But in reality, it's, it's not true. Thank you. We're going to soon open it up to questions, but I'd like to ask each one of you to answer w w one more, is to think about sort of personal story or per a personal story to your organization of something where you think your, your activities, the activities of your organization has made a difference, a positive difference as a lesson for how we could go forward. If I could just start with you again, uh, Bruno, then we'll go to the next to something, one specific case where you think uh, Human Rights Watch or, or some personal story ma made a difference. Uh, so maybe just to uh, return to what I mentioned regarding Syria, because it's been such a hopeless scenario where there has been such a dereliction of duty by the international community. Um, this new mechanism that was established, this independent and partial uh, international mechanism that is already preparing case-ready files in terms of serious violations committed by all parties in this conflict in Syria, 
this is a, a game changer, potentially. This is a UN-based mechanism established by the General Assembly. So it was basically um, a recognition that the Security Council had failed in its duty to protect civilians in Syria. The General Assembly stepping in, led by the smallest of nations you could imagine, Liechtenstein, which basically puts to shame the international community and all the powers that be, that they did not have the collective courage to do this. It was a huge political lift for Liechtenstein. Human Rights Watch was, of course, working very closely behind with Liechtenstein. And this passed by 110 votes uh, in the General Assembly. What happened on the day of the adoption of this mechanism was that Russia sent a letter to the Secretary General saying that the General Assembly had overstepped its mandate and basically betrayed the United Nations Charter. I think no letter could actually speak to the importance of this mechanism more than the very fact that Russia was doing a demarche on the Secretary General. And thanks to this, we now have these case-ready files that are being prepared. And as I mentioned, this mechanism now can be replicated elsewhere, precisely to reach those regions of the world where the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court cannot reach because the states are not party to the Rome Statute or because of the lack of courage within the Security Council to refer a situation to the International Criminal Court. So I think that was one of our, our organization's proudest moments. This happened in 2016, and as I mentioned, now it has been replicated in Myanmar in 2018 through the Human Rights Council. Thank you. Andrew. Let me give you a more individual or personal story. Uh, Claudia Duque is a journalist and woman human rights defender in Colombia. Almost 20 years ago, her friend and colleague, also a journalist, Jaime Garzón, was murdered. She took up his case, she wrote about his case, she campaigned for the people who were responsible for killing him to be brought to justice. She faced death threats, she faced threats against her daughter, and, and one of the good uh, points uh, about the need to protect human rights defenders is about the specific and additional risks women human rights defenders also face. Three times she had to leave the country and then went back in spite of the threats uh, that she faced. We provided uh, emergency relocation support. We provided support for security in our office, a reinforced steel door in our home. She also benefited from protection from others, including from the Colombian state uh, protection program that provided her with a, a armored car for a while. But she persisted. She continued working alongside others over almost 20 years. And this summer, the senior intelligence official uh, in Colombia who was responsible for that murder was finally convicted. And it's a story of hope. There are too many human rights defenders who have been killed in Colombia. And it, it's not a country that's going in a good direction at the moment. The level of killings of human rights defenders is increasing. But it shows that when the right constellation of support can come in and to support the human rights defenders, they can eventually achieve justice. And that gives us hope going forward, both for the situation in Colombia, but also more broadly, that practical me measures to support the security and protection of those fighting for justice does make a difference. And it's human rights defenders working at the local and national level who will, in the end, make a difference in achieving justice. But the international community can do more to support them, to help them to persevere in that struggle. And of course, your project is, is, is one of those ways of both defending people and, for, and one for which I know you have EU assistance, but yeah. maybe others can help to achieve the same goal. Always. I got anything personal from your own experience, and of course, you've been very personally involved and your family's been personally involved, something where you saw the power of individuals or of civil society uh, achieving a result. Um, I'm very humble to, to, to raise my own case. For myself, uh, my husband, he's the human rights lawyer, and he have a lot of uh, people in all over the country who were violated by the by the state officer. And on 12 of March 2004, he was abducted by the police, and he disappeared until now. Um, on the way of my struggle for for human rights. Um, I found that it's really difficult for an ordinary woman or ordinary people to fight for human rights. I spent uh, 12 years in the court on the disappear of my husband. And at the end, I'm lost. The Supreme Court acquit the case and nobody found guilty. And during the past 14 years, 
I often receive threats, even death threat. And it's not happened only to me, but it's happened in a lot of human rights defenders. So I think that uh, this is uh, very important. I not want to like to speak like case by case, but we should look at uh, uh, like the holistic to solve our problem. It's like that uh, when some people disappear or killed it, they have no investigation. Maybe some have some investigation, but have no strong evidence. And at the end, nobody found guilty. So it's happened again and again. If we want to stop this kind of intimidation and harassment to human rights defenders, I think we need we need uh, the political will. I think the the state have obligation to protect all the people. And I think that for the role of human rights defenders and women human rights defenders, it's not like myself, no. Uh, you know that I'm very high profile. But I want to mention about uh, a lot of human rights defenders, especially women, who some of them are indigenous people, some of them are the local people in uh, the remote area. So they stay, they live in fear. And I think that each state must protect all the people. Uh, in the past year, we often uh, ask the state to have the regulation or to have some mechanism to protect the human rights defenders. We need the concrete. We need a concrete solution. It's not like the verbal, it's like that uh, we try to protect everybody, but in reality, it's not true. The intimidation and harassment often happen every day, and the perpetrators walk freely. So this is uh, what has happened nowadays. Uh, my recommendation is uh, I, I like to see that uh, in all nations, respect the role of human rights defenders and have sincerity to protect the human rights defenders, not seeing that human rights defenders is like their enemy, not seeing that human rights defenders are want to attack the country or other people. I think we have to, to, be, to have more sincerity when talking about this. Thank you. So I think uh, I'm going to quickly wrap up, then we'll open it up to the, to the audience. I mean, I think it's a message of, of, of resilience, of, of a movement that has sort of a storied history and has actually achieved quite a bit, but is facing uh, sort of wrong against the current right now, uh, and a current that is for all the reasons that we've, we've explored, but through support for civil society, support for the defenders of, the, of, 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 of human rights, or defending the defenders of human rights, uh, preserving evidence, accountability, creative means. I mean, the, you, you mentioned Myanmar, but there's also you know, the ICC uh, has also shown creativity in, uh, in that case um, as well. Targeted sanctions, and again, one could have a debate about the effectiveness, and, and, but I think the cases that were mentioned are cases where sanctions were either threatened or the lifting of sanctions was clearly associated to steps that a country like Sudan could take. Um, so some, uh, some optimism, but of course, no, uh, far from being complacent given, given the situation we face today. And I want to thank you for your efforts. But open it up uh, to questions. You could raise your hand and you'll be identified. You could also send questions through, uh, which I get on my app, iPad through some mysterious uh, mechanism. But uh, I will take, uh, I take one and two. I'll take a few of them, uh, one and two, and then we'll, we'll, we'll answer those. Hi. Uh, my name is Amin Hussein. I'm an exile-based human rights activist. And when you ask about examples, I just want to say for sometimes, UN member states like Switzerland, when they want, they're able to save the human rights defenders. And especially in my case, the Swiss embassy in Azerbaijan hosted me when the government wanted to arrest me. And I spent one year in Swiss embassy and after Swiss leadership bring me out for Azerbaijan, but it's only single cases like mine. Maybe this happened from last 25 years in the post-Soviet area in some African state in Latin America. 
But my question to all participants, how we seriously able to help to human rights defenders which is staying on the front line? Because uh, the will, which is uh, a colleague says, for dictatorships never have the will to change anything. And I'm not optimist for m government like mine or in somebody in Turkmenistan or Uzbekistan find the political will because people which have stolen billions from his nations, they never find the will to going for a clear way. And how to all stakeholders, like multi stakeholders initiative, able to ch really change? Because even in my case, I'm able to escape, but it's only a single case. But many my colleagues, my brothers still in the prison, people which has helped me to uh, escape, they killed in Azerbaijan one year later. And today, when I look to my colleague in Azerbaijan, EU or UN still didn't find solutions from human rights defenders which is want to continue his uh, actions. They are leaving them alone. They are staying without funds. They government change the environment, don't provide any kind of possibilities to receive donations, nothing. Just we are completely destroyed. And now the strength going on in different countries. How global leaderships and with civil society able to change? Because now I think for it's many of you representative of the civil societies and nobody from uh, governments participate in the panel, maybe. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, and, and thank you for that question. I'm, I'll ask if, if people could keep the questions relatively short so we could get as many as possible. So number two. In French, uh, thank you. Alors, je vous remercie, uh, pour so maybe if you give a second for, for those who don't speak French to put their, their mics on, their, their headsets on. Could you give just one second? Uh, if you all speak French, do you all understand French? Do you want to, so maybe you need to put the, uh, this on. Sorry. Thank you. And then if somebody could tell her what, what number, what channel, channel one for, for, for English. OK, is good? Thank you. But, yeah, please. Uh, merci. Alors, moi, je viens du Congo Brazzaville, uh, où nous vivons depuis près de 40 ans une dictature féroce. Um, et euh, tout à l'heure, vous avez parlé de la défense des droits euh, de, des hommes, des droits humains. C'était un rapport de force. Alors, la question que je me pose aujourd'hui, pourquoi ne pas initier, comme dans le cadre du chapitre 7 euh, du Conseil de sécurité, où il y a, euh, quand il y a la menace euh, à la sécurité internationale, on applique le chapitre 7. Alors, pourquoi ne pas initier ce genre de chapitre pour la défense des droits humains dans le cadre de... Euh, de la violation flagrante des droits humains. Je me dis pourquoi on ne peut pas aller dans ce sens-là, parce qu'au Congo-Brazzaville, nous luttons depuis des années contre une dictature qui bombarde la population civile, qui est femme. Et aujourd'hui, c'est un pays qui vit comme... C'est une prison à ciel ouvert. Donc on tue, celui qui est au pouvoir tue comme il veut. Et d'ailleurs, il a été invité à l'ouverture du forum sur la paix à Paris. Donc ça nous a tous étonnés que ça soit ça. Et nous, on est là, on n'arrête pas de, de se battre pour qu'il y ait une alternance démocratique. Parce que sans alternance, il n'y a pas de paix, il n'y a pas de développement. Et ça, il faut le dire, surtout en Afrique centrale. Donc nous avons un monde qui avance. En fait, chacun, c'est plus l'Occident qui avance dans les droits humains, la défense des droits humains. Donc on aimerait bien aussi qu'en Afrique, surtout en Afrique francophone, et c'est ce que euh, je, je, donnais, je dénonce ici, c'est surtout en Afrique centrale que M. Macron qui initie ce forum de paix, qu'il reçoive des dictateurs qui, eux, euh, mettent le désordre chez eux, qu'il n'y a pas de paix, qu'il n'y a pas des droits humains qui sont respectés au Congo-Brazzaville. Donc c'est pourquoi ne pas instaurer la charte comme l'article, le chapitre 7 de la, du Conseil de sécurité ou de, de la Charte des Nations Unies qui prévoit l'intervention justement par la force euh, en cas de, de violation flagrante de la sécurité. Voilà ce que je Merci. voulais euh, dire ici. Merci de m'avoir accordé la parole. Peut-être une autre question, numéro 7, et puis vous allez répondre. Merci. Merci. 
I had a question because you talked about the problem of accountability and especially the uh, power and the will of states. Uh, I was just wondering who do you think or who can be capable to enforce the verdicts taken by the ICC? And if not states who are sometimes incapable or unwilling, do you think that uh, a global police force or prison would be the solution to actually um, make these people accountable? So three questions which actually go more or less in the same direction, which is how do you convince states? Are there means, international means, whether it's a, someone like a Chapter 7 or some international mechanism? So whoever wants to take this first, I'll turn to all three of you, but uh, go ahead. Sure, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start in inverse order. So on the ICC, one of the misfortunes of the ICC is that you have many states that obviously have ratified their own statute, but they're not living up to their commitment to cooperate with the court. And that's where we've had failures many significant states parties that are not arresting people who visit. Um, South Africa, for example, comes to mind. Um, a Security Council that has referred two situations, Darfur and Libya, and yet then is unwilling to cooperate with the prosecutor of the ICC, thereby basically in dereliction of its duties, uh, the Security Council. Um, so what we need is basically a reconfirmation of the Rome Statute spirit. That means that basically uh, those that have signed up to this statute will cooperate with the court. And I must say that I think we have found probably the best rallying cry we could because uh, the, the new National Security Advisor of the U.S., Mr. John Bolton, has taken it almost as a personal crusade to deride the court. And uh, in his coming out speech as National Security Advisor, he said that the International Criminal Court represented the greatest threat to the United States. It was such an over-exaggeration, of course, that what it has done is that it has really rallied support for the court. And we're starting to see support for the court public and private in ways that we did not see over many years past, because basically what we needed was basically somebody to really challenge the existence of this court. So thank you, Mr. John Bolton, for doing this. Um, on Chapter 7, I take your point about Chapter 7, and of course it's a very intricate uh, part of the UN Charter. What we were talking about, the targeted sanctions fall within Chapter 7. I don't think we necessarily want to have military interventions. Military interventions are not necessarily the best solution. Many times military interventions actually lead to a lot of unintended consequences. Think of Libya. But I do think that there is a need, of course, for the Security Council, since you specifically ask about Chapter 7, to address a lot more situations that are not on its agenda. It has been extremely poor in doing early warning and prevention and in bringing issues to the attention of the Security Council more aggressively. And this is, I think, a, 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 not only the responsibility of the Security Council, but also of specific members. And in this sense, France plays a key role. It is obviously a permanent member. It has a certain right of oversight over Francophone Africa, or at least it pretends to, since it's the pen holder on all African issues, Francophone African issues on the Security Council. But let's not forget that there are other possibilities. The Secretary General of the United Nations can also bring situations to the attention of the Security Council via what is known as Article 99. So he can also tell the Security Council what it needs to know and not what it wants to hear. So all of these are mechanisms that I think are, are, are useful. And I'll leave uh, the specific case of Azerbaijan. You're obviously better versed than I. But I do think that what we need is more multilateral opprobium on those leaders who basically want to host mega events, sporting or singing events, as Azerbaijan has done in the past, in a way of burnishing its credentials as a country that is open for business and open for investment, when in fact what it's doing to its own civil society is basically to crush it. And that we do not need, the, especially the Council of Europe and especially the European Union, to play into the hands of those that want to present open, open for business but close to civil society. Yeah, I'd like to first of all say it's great to see Amin here. Um, I think one of the challenges in terms of Azerbaijan, in addition to what Bruno was saying, is that a number of donors who were working there and in some other countries where restrictive uh, legislation has been brought in to try and stop support for human rights defenders on the ground have pulled out, both uh, government donors, the EU itself, as well as some private foundations. And the really important thing is to continue to provide support, practical support to human rights defenders on the front line when they are under attack. One of the things that uh, Khadija Ismailova, another brave human rights defender from Azerbaijan said when we had a meeting with some of the donors during the crackdown was that if you disappear when our human rights defenders are in prison 
and their families need resources to keep them alive in prison, to be able to get them food and medical treatment that they need, then how do you expect the human rights movement to be resilient and to be able to push back against this backlash? And I do think there is a, a challenge to the international community to be stronger in finding creative ways to get practical to support to people when they are at immediate threat. And it was great that the Swiss was, were able to help in, in your individual case, but I think we need more action, uh, and especially by some of the European governments in pushing back on some of that. And I'd also like to just mention, in terms of Congo, uh, Brazzaville, the, and it links to what Bruno was saying. You know, we live in a, a world of governments. We need to have relations with authoritarian governments. We can't live in isolation from them. But we don't need to roll out the red carpet for dictators either. And I really think that democratic governments need to take a look at themselves and how they engage with some of the most brutal and repressive uh, leaders around the world. We're not saying never speak to them or never engage with them. But the pictures that we too often see of uh, kings from the Gulf or dictators from uh, Congo, Brazzaville, or other repressive people having the red carpet rolled out for them shows a lack of moral courage, a lack of backbone on the side of those who should be stronger in defense of human rights and democracy. Thank you. Do you have any, uh, any answers to these? Um, I agree that uh, with our uh, democracy, uh, we, we cannot have peace. But uh, for democracy in, in all countries, uh, I think that uh, the most important is that uh, how we have, uh, how uh, each country have the security sector reform. Uh, I mean, uh, we need uh, police reform, military reform, or judicial system reform, so that uh, people can access, uh, can easily access to justice, and uh, we can have uh, people can uh, have their own network. They can have freedom of expression. I think uh, this is uh, important, and I do. I do believe in uh, people power, and I think that uh, when people uh, come together, and I think with the support uh, from the international communities, uh, I think uh, it will help. Um, I think it's very sad uh, if uh, maybe uh, human rights defenders receive a threat, and they cannot uh, stay in their own country. They have to, to escape. To, to stay, uh, to live like the asylum seeker in other countries. Um, but I think that the most important is the how each state can, uh, they have the uh, obligation to protect their own population. I think um, this is very important, and I, I think the donors and also the international community should have a uh, recommendation to all the state to, to follow the, the UN guidelines, uh, and all the uh, international com convention as well. Thank you. Let me take the next round. Uh, we'll go seven, eight, and one, and then, and then we'll come to you. Then that's the next round. Sorry. Go ahead. Je je fais suite à Madame la Commissaire pour juste rappeler que nous sommes à 70 ans de la de la DUDH. L'article 28 de la DUDH prône une responsabilité collective, notre responsabilité collective, à la mise en place d'un environnement favorable au respect de la DUDH. Je veux parler de la déclaration des droits de l'homme. Mais vous voyez, c'est souvent difficile. Elle a tout le temps maintenu la question concernant la volonté politique. C'est souvent difficile pour un défenseur des droits de l'homme d'être dans un pays où la veille ou quelques jours avant, le Parlement vote une loi de restriction de l'espace civique Et dans le même temps, vous voyez l'Union européenne, ou bien vous voyez le PNUD, s'il y a un accord sur trois ans, quatre ans, à hauteur de millions de dollars avec lui. Vous vous posez la question de savoir si vraiment cette coopération internationale, ou bien cette responsabilité collective, qui doit mettre en place un environnement favorable pour le respect des droits de l'homme, est vraiment une réalité. Je ne veux pas insister eh, sur le défaut, en fait, eh, d'efficacité des mécanismes, parce que les mécanismes sont de très hauts mécanismes au niveau, au niveau onusien. Je veux parler de l'examen périodique universel, 
un mécanisme sur lequel j'ai tout le temps travaillé dans mon pays. Mais c'est difficile de comprendre que le cadre de coopération internationale euh, ne s'appuie pas en fait sur les recommandations qui sont faites pour avoir un agenda de coopération tant politique, économique que sociale avec ce pays. C'est un peu tout comme si ensemble on s'accorde, on, on, on convient d'instruments et de mécanismes sur lesquels quand il s'agit au lieu de faire une démocratie, au lieu de faire une diplomatie de valeurs et de principes, on constate tout simplement que c'est en fait une diplomatie de dollars et d'euros. Tout simplement. Donc, euh, très sincèrement, je sais que dans tous nos pays, aujourd'hui, avec les contraintes que nous vivons, les défenseurs des droits de l'homme, franchement, sont motivés, ils sont engagés. Mais il faut faire attention à ne pas vraiment émousser le hasard. La réalité politique, la réalité géopolitique autour de nous n'est pas de nature à motiver. Et nous sommes vraiment désespérés. Merci. Merci. Hi, good morning. Um, Congo Félix Agbo from Cameroon. I want to start by thanking um, everybody on the panel and acknowledge the wonderful support that the international community, especially international organizations, have given human rights defenders in Cameroon in particular. Um, I was a victim of um, the human rights atrocities by my government, arrested on the 17th of January 2017 for peaceful protests by the English-speaking lawyers, and I was charged on seven counts of terrorism, incitement of civil war, group rebellion, secession, amongst others. But the pressure of frontline defenders, Human Rights Watch, Amnesty International, and International Crisis Group ensured that after eight months, the president signed a decree to release me. But we are not only looking at those who supposedly might be high profile. My former boss in the human rights section of the UN, Ms. Nora, who is here also, they did a lot. But there, were, there are more than a thousand others who were arrested with me who, as we speak, they are still in jail. Because there is a thin line between the 2014 anti-terrorism law and the fight for human rights. So it is easy, this meeting that we are having here today, if you look at the 2014 law, Article 1.1, it would amount to terrorism. So everybody who can criticize or can dissent with the government would be tried for, for terrorism. So I think there is a need for the international community to put more pressure on these governments, not just for those who might be high profile, but just like um, Anderson of um, Frontline Defenders said, there should be measures put in place to protect those, especially in the rural areas, who are doing an enormous job, but they might not have the profile like those who are based in the city center. And we are going through a very difficult situation in Cameroon. It has never happened. If you look at the Central African region, the lady said she's from the, from the Congo Brazzaville. Cameroon is supposedly the state that is not the most viable in the area. So if Cameroon goes down, Central Africa, Gabon, Equatorial Guinea, Chad, and Congo Brazzaville goes down. But the situation which is happening in Cameroon, where at least 140 villages have been burnt, a kind of collective punishment against the Anglophones, a thousand in jail and more than 4,000 have been killed, 500,000 internally displaced and 50,000 as refugees in Nigeria. It doesn't really get, you know, the, the mainstream media. I don't know whether everybody wants us to get to the Darfur situation, whether it must be a genocide because there's an argument that it's a war crime or crimes against humanity. Does it need to meet the threshold of a genocide before we need the international community? So I want to seize this opportunity to urge the eminent panelists and everybody who, um, who is a friend of international justice, who is a friend to ensure that, I mean, countries don't fall into more problems that we need to speak out against what is happening in Cameroon. Um, the English speaking and the French speaking Cameroonians are going through a lot. And if care is not taken, international crisis group is of the opinion that we, we are not in a civil war. I also think that we're not, get, we're not yet in a civil war, but if care is not taken, Cameroon will slide into a civil war. Thank you. Bonjour, uh, je pose une question en français. C'est la personne. Je peux Oui, oui allez-y. Okay, merci. Euh, Bouchaïb Jioui, je suis de l'initiative européenne pour le développement et l'inclusion sociale. Je remercie mon collègue de, de, du Cameroun parce que vraiment, ma question est dans la continuité de ce qu'il vient de dire. Tous les conflits que vous avez cités tout à l'heure, 
sont des conflits pratiquement, que ce soit au Yémen, en Israël, au Cameroun, au Azerbaïdjan, sont des conflits qui concernent tout simplement la diversité des expressions culturelles. On a des pouvoirs qui rejettent et qui refusent la diversité des expressions culturelles. Ce matin, il y a un débat sur la question de l'immigration. Il a pris un peu une tournure qui ne m'a pas du tout plu. On a posé l'immigration et les immigrés comme un problème. Et on a penché vraiment... Toute la réflexion était sur comment régler ce problème, là, voilà, et comment les inclure, etc. Et on n'a jamais posé la question du rôle et de la place de la société d'accueil, notamment en Europe, et leur capacité à inclure les immigrés, enfin les, les, les demandeurs d'asile notamment, et cette capacité est pratiquement nulle, tout simplement parce qu'il y a un, un problème au niveau de l'acceptation la, du principe de la diversité culturelle. La question est la suivante. Est-ce qu'on peut concevoir demain euh, de poser le principe de, de protection et de défense de la diversité culturelle comme une norme impérative, un use que gains dans le sens vraiment de l'article 53 de la Convention de Vienne de 69 Sincèrement, je ne pense pas que le Conseil de sécurité, les membres permanents des conseils de sécurité seraient d'accord pour cela. Et je ne pense pas que, pour le dire à notre ami Bruno de Human Rights Watch, que Liechtenstein serait d'accord aussi pour, pour aller dans ce sens. Alors que c'est l'évidence, tous les problèmes que vous avez soulevés, le Cameroun, la Somalie, le, le Yémen aujourd'hui qui est massacré, qui est bombardé, c'est une question tout simplement de droit, d'exprimer, d'expression culturelle qui est rejeté, refusé par des nations, que ce soit l'Arabie saoudite, que ce soit Israël, que ce soit des, des dictateurs dans tel ou tel pays africain. Est-ce qu'on peut concevoir demain, par exemple, au niveau de l'Assemblée générale de l'ONU ou au Conseil de sécurité, de, 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 prendre, de poser la question de la défense, la protection de la diversité culturelle comme étant un impéra, une norme impérative, un use que gains Voilà, question très simple. Merci. Okay, so why don't we take these three, and, and there's a question we just heard about uh, uh, protecting cultural diversity, but the other two also had to do with dilemmas that I think we need to face. One is, how, again, how do you balance, uh, the gentleman asked, uh, sort of, uh, how do you balance what you said was the need to continue to engage countries, even when they are violators of human rights, and, and make sure that if they need economic assistance or the, the, the civil populations need humanitarian assistance, you don't, want to, you don't want to punish them for the actions of their, of their leaders. So how do you make that distinction of keeping the pressure but without punishing the people, which is, uh, you know, you started to, to, to get into that. And the other one is the question we heard, obviously there's a whole issue of Cameroon which you could get into, but also uh, the issue of sometimes countries will use high-profile cases to conceal sort of the more structural problems. And we, one can think of one example after another where attention is on one high-profile case, the government releases that person and then hopes that the attention will, will, will fade away. So how do you balance, and you mentioned the high-profile case in, in Colombia, how do you balance that focus, which gives an, almost gives an out to regimes that can say, okay, let, let's, uh, let's address this one. So again, uh, why don't we start in the other order? Uh, maybe you're going to start off any, anything on, on any of the questions that you heard that you would like to comment on. I think uh, it's very challenging uh, because uh, now we are we celebrate seven years uh, human rights declaration. By the way, there's uh, many thing, many challenges happen in the world uh, as we uh, discuss about the migration situation of migration, um, and also the it's increased the extremism all over the world and. Also, uh, I think that uh, maybe the tolerance of people is reduced. Sometimes we cannot tolerance to diversity. We cannot tolerance to uh, some uh, religions or practices. Uh, and this, uh, this make the, this, this, uh, this cause the situation of, of violence also. Um, I want to, I want to bring uh, all this uh, to the um, to the role of uh, human rights defenders. Uh, I think that uh, for myself, um, I think one thing we need is the clear definition of uh, human rights defenders. Uh, if we not have the clear, we we are, we have the, the definition of human rights defenders in the EU guideline or UN, but uh, in in law. 
our constitution of our country do not have the correct de uh, definition. So that uh, in many countries, they're not respected the rights of the uh, human rights defenders. So um, I, I think this is uh, very important. I think the most challenges is the, how we can implement it how we can implement it, the law, and about the discretion of the law, how can we interpret the discretion of the law to be like to, to positive and to protect the, the people. Um, I want to, to say something more about the, the extremists. I see now it's happened in, in many countries, uh, especially the religious extremists, uh, human rights defenders who work on the LGBT or women rights often face the death threat when they protect the rights of the LGBT person. So uh, I think uh, this is uh, very uh, important to, that we have to talk more on this. And I think that uh, we have to, to work together that uh, how can we how can we uh, have uh, some mechanism to, to protect? And I think uh, it's very challenging. Many people talking every day about the migration. In, and in some countries, uh, for example, in Thailand, um, many of the refugee and asylum seekers were detained at in, uh, detention facilities because uh, when they have uh, when they are like the illegal migration and have overstay, have no uh, visa. So it's uh, criminalized uh, in, in Thailand in, in many countries. Uh, this is uh, very important that uh, how can we uh, amend the law to, so that uh, we can uh, be friends with uh, everybody. And in the global, uh, I think we need uh, some, uh, uh, not only the political view, but also uh, to make uh, people understanding about uh, how can we respect to the dignity and value of all people, not only regarding to their race, sex, or whatever. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's a good question when we when we look at funding and funding relationships. I, I don't think anybody is strongly against humanitarian support if it's genuinely reaching local populations going in whatever the context. I think the bigger question is around development funding. And if we look at the sustainable development goals that talk about the importance of an enabling environment for civil society, if we look at the indicators on development effectiveness that talk about partnership, transparency, accountability, then those can only be achieved where human rights defenders, where local people have voice, are able to organize, are able to speak out. So when governments bring in restrictive legislation on civil society, donors that are funding development projects in partnership with the government need to have pause. We wouldn't call for, for cutting off um, funding in all circumstances, but they need to have pause because it's going against what they've signed up to and the sustainable development goals, and there has to be consequences when governments take action against civil society within the development framework, within the context of the SDGs, particularly SDG 16 on governance that has specific clauses about uh, monitoring attacks on human rights defenders and, and journalists. So I think that's a big debate and it's part of how we need to have a more joined up discussion that includes people working in development, the environment as well as human rights and how we address some of these issues. Briefly I also wanted to say that the, the restrictive legislation and, and the use of terrorism or other security charges against human rights defenders is the most common thing that we see globally against human rights defenders and it's something that many human rights defenders in many parts of the world are facing and we need the international community to be a little bit stronger in standing up to that because I think sometimes um, governments and international mechanisms are a little bit wary of taking up people who are accused of being terrorists or accused on no grounds of, of advocating violence. Uh, and we need to be more robust in how we do that. And, and just briefly also to say, I, I, I think I'll leave Bruno to answer the question on the legal situation 
in terms of migration. But what we are seeing as well is criminalization of those working to support and provide humanitarian assistance uh, to those who are attempting to cross boundaries. And we're also seeing the, the hate speech and repressive legislation and the mobilization of, of, um, of populist groups against those who are defending the rights of migrants, of refugees, asylum seekers, who are promoting pluralism in a number of countries. And it's obviously particularly worrying what's happening in Hungary at the moment. So just 30 seconds, I'll just add on the issue of, of using the label of terrorism. I do think Western countries have, a, have to, to take a look at themselves about how that label has served other countries using it and then overusing it and exploiting it in a way um, to go after anyone who's labeled terrorist. And I think Western countries and their fixation on this issue has, and on the war against terrorism has, have contributed to some extent to that. Um, Bruno. Absolutely, on, on that vein. Uh, Terrorism has been probably the biggest handout that the West has provided to all types of autocrats. Think of Sisi in Egypt. Um, on the guise of terrorism, he has basically been able to basically shut down anything that is contrary to uh, the Sisi regime. You're demonized as a Muslim Brotherhood uh, member uh, just because you want to somehow oppose any decision, any action taken by the government. So we really need to, while obviously keeping uh, the radar clearly on site in terms of, yes, there is a terrorist threat, that the overarching legislations that have been basically adopted in the West and beyond um, have been have provided a ex perfect excuse for people to basically clamp down on civil society. Um, I'm, I'm very glad you brought the issue of Cameroon, and I think it's uh, it basically is one of the tests... Uh, one of these canneries in the tunnel that show us that we are failing in our duty to do early warning and prevention. Where all of the warning signs were available, um, where there were sufficient levers on President Biya to somehow uh, address the situation differently from how it's being addressed. Um, and we hear a lot, especially since uh, the UN Secretary General was here talking about the importance he gives to early warning and prevention. Well, he certainly has a role to play. As I mentioned, Article 99 gives him the authority to do so. But I, also, I think we also should not exonerate some of the African institutions, because some of the comments I've heard from some of our partners here, coming either from Congo or from Cameroon, um, is basically faulting the UN, the international community in the abstract. But at times, when the international community has tried to address situations in Africa, very often what they find is this collective response about African solutions to African problems. Um, and you see it day in and day out in the General Assembly in the Human Rights Council, where you actually have competing resolutions at times presented by the European Union, for example, on Burundi. And then you have an African group resolution which basically exonerates Pre President Nkurunziza. Same thing on the Democratic Republic of Congo, an EU resolution which would basically tackle uh, President Kabila, and you have an African group joint resolution which basically says exonerates President Kabila of everything. So there's a lot of uh, responsibility to go around, and what we need is actually people like you to speak out, the civil society to speak out, so that we can have larger accountability. On, on the issue of, uh, you know, uh, Juice Cogens, I, I get your point, but this, I, unfortunately, I don't think this is the moment for us to build new law, or at least uh, what we're trying to do is defend what we have. Um, the, the geopolitical moment we're living is not one for many new conventions and treaties. Uh, we obviously would like to see more on complementary protection to migrants and refugees, especially. But here, once again, um, I think we all recognize how limited the uh, protections provided by the Refugee Convention are, in light of the fact that it was designed for a world that is no longer with us. Um, and many of the people that we would like to see benefiting from complementary protection cannot because of the very uh, uh, restrictive definition given to refugees. Uh, but I, I understand your point about how um, you might not have liked the way that the migrant and the refugee issue is being proposed uh, or dealt with today. We're not living any longer a migrant crisis. The numbers have fallen dramatically. What we have, however, in 2018 is the highest level of deaths in the central Mediterranean, notwithstanding the lowest uh, crossings on record. So this is basically something that has reached the highest levels of political imagination because people are instrumentalizing, demonizing, and, scape and scare scaremongering uh, in using the refugees uh, as a, a political tool. 
instead of looking into their own obligations in terms of delivering asylum and refugee protection. But I'm, I'm happy to continue the conversation on, on this side. Okay, we only have about five or six minutes to go, so I'll take three questions. I don't think I'll get everyone. See, so somebody is very eager to, to speak, but I have to, I have to go through the numbers. I'm sorry. So I have number four, three, I don't know where that is, eight. And then I think we're going to have to close unless, I don't know if it's, it was, was uh, cause is, is, is he number one? <laughs> okay, so why don't we go, but very quickly, very quick questions, very quick answers, four, three, eight, and then uh, now I can't remember that number, one and eight. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Carlos Rito. I um, serve as the executive secretary for Brazilian Climate Observatory. Brazil is the, world, the country that kills more environmentalists in worldwide and uh, also land, uh, land rights movements. And uh, right now we are going through a significant change, a new government coming to power, the hate speech, and um, we, we are running the risk to see anti-terrorism legislation changing to include land movements as terrorists. And um, my question is very, very brief, and uh, what's the strongest message that should come from the international community to prevent things to go really bad before this government comes to power in the beginning of the year, and who should be the messenger? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Chair, for giving me the, um, the opportunity to ask the question. Um, since I'm, well, I'm coming from Beijing, where I'm based, and uh, we lots of th issues we work back in China. One of them is human rights education. And I do have a European face here, and um, in the ways that I work in Europe, I have obviously in The Hague, so I work in two very different worlds. That's my background. My question is that in my work, lots of the uh, challenges I have is to persuade people a country-specific human rights situation is a threat to peace in general, globally. Say, um, because again, coming from a very different context from um, our African um, brothers, that um, in a very big country, say Russia, putting away hypothetically one million um, of its own citizen in camps for national security reasons, how is that a threat to global peace since we're in the Paris Peace Forum? Thank, Thank you. you. Please. Bonjour et merci beaucoup, Claude Tamba. Uh, moi, je voudrais juste uh, d'abord poser la question à vous qui êtes là, parce que vous êtes des experts, à ce que je sache. Mais maintenant, j'ai participé à beaucoup de conférences. Déjà, on n'a pas beaucoup de temps. On nous presse. Et là, c'est très important ce qu'on est en train de faire là. Et vous, euh, vous êtes des experts. On peut vous voir sur Internet, on peut vous voir partout. On a besoin de gens qui doivent prendre des décisions, qui doivent nous écouter, comme tous ceux qui ont parlé avant moi. Parce qu'on se rejette la responsabilité. Je voudrais savoir, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas moyen de faire, par exemple, le football qui est un sport public, qu'on interdise l'organisation à, à, à des compétitions, à des États qui ne respectent pas les droits de l'homme, par exemple le Qatar et, dans, et la Russie qui vient d'organiser, c'est des pays qui ne respectent pas les droits de l'homme. Il faut qu'il y ait quelque chose qui doit marquer, sinon on va parler 107 ans, il y aura pas, c'est la même chose et ça, ça s'appelle de la folie. Parce que la folie, c'est reprendre la même chose, s'attendre à d'autres résultats. Donc je voudrais savoir, est-ce qu'il n'y a pas moyen Soit vous, vous êtes du côté de, de l'humain, parce que là, on représente l'humain carrément. Vous êtes du côté de l'humain, le football, tout le monde, pauvre, riche, on regarde tous les matchs, on regarde tous la Coupe du Monde. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas moyen de transmettre, d'imposer, parce que ce n'est pas à négocier là, les, les droits de l'homme. Et et parce que ça ramène quoi L'immigration, qui est une conséquence dont les gens ne parlent pas. Et la cause, c'est la France, par exemple, qui organise ce forum, malheureusement, fait partie de la cause, parce que les armes vendues en Afrique ou ailleurs, c'est ces armes-là qui se retournent contre les peuples. Et on ne comprend pas, moi je ne moi je comprends pas. Et vous poussez aujourd'hui, quand on dit la gouvernance, ces gens-là sont votés dans des pays comme la France, dans, les pays comme la, dans tous les pays d'Europe, c'est la démocratie. On a, on, et on peut, les peuples n'ont pas, pas de frontières, on n'a pas de problème avec le peuple français, le peuple américain, c'est nos dirigeants qui sont les premiers diviseurs. Parce que quand ils viennent là, ils sont élus par le peuple et ils sont là pour les industries. Merci. On doit, on doit, mais merci beaucoup okay, pour votre question. Very last question. Very brief, please. Yes, I'm going to keep it brief. My name is Ariel Benson, and I, I'm Secretary General of an organization for young people called JCI. And I want to take this conversation to the future because I think we've spent a lot of time talking about the status quo. But what about the future? 
and, and I say this because of the changing times that we're living, we know that governments and instruments have not been, have, have worked to a certain extent. But as we look at the future and we see that citizens are going to have more responsibility and become more powerful, how do we look to the future? Because the Human Rights Declaration is not a law. It is a set of values that we humans agree to. But how do we see the future where we ensure that beyond the man-made boundaries, we can begin to see how citizens, individuals, organizations, businesses play a more vital role in ensuring that every citizen's rights are protected? Thank you so much. So very briefly, unfortunately, maybe 30 seconds or so per, per person, if you want to, uh, any concluding remarks, any answers, obviously, you can give. Uh, if you could start, uh, please. Uh, but, but I will uh, say very briefly, I think uh, um, we have called so far uh, for the, uh, since uh, uh, we have the uh, Human Rights Declaration, uh, and all the nations still face the, the, the same problems, um, migration, refugees, and when we talk about human rights defenders, uh, I think uh, it's easy to say that uh, it's the state's accountability, but in reality, it's really difficult. But uh, how can the international community, I think international communities also have a big role uh, to not only to like sanction, but uh, international communities have to support all the state to protect their own citizen. And one thing that I think is important is that uh, I think we have to empower the people. We have to empower the human rights defenders and the affected uh, communities. Uh, how can they organize, uh, how can they have the network, and how can they work together? I think this is uh, this very important as well. Thank you. Very briefly. Uh, very briefly, in terms of Brazil, I think we need to focus on killings of human rights defenders, both in the urban area and in the rural areas. We need to look at those who are funding some of the projects in the rural areas where people are being killed. And I think we need to look to the future as well. And I think the future is positive because I think we see more and more young people engaged in the struggle for human rights, and that's good for us. I'm very, OK. Okay, I, I think we have to end unless there's something very brief. I, I want to invite all of you to stay here because we're going to now have a sustainable development fashion show. Okay. So please stay for, 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 for that. It's organized by uh, the late Kofi Annan's daughter. In the meantime, if you could please give a hand to our panelists and, and thank you for your participation.